All right, welcome back to the 30-hour post-licensing course. Uh, we are getting ready to start the fourth lesson and talk a little bit about the listing and the purchase agreements specifically <clears throat> as to what is conferred in the agreements, what is actually promised between the parties, and when it enters into when the parties enter and what can terminate these. So a listing contract is a voluntary agreement between a principal and a client. In this particular case, since we are dealing with the listing, it is between the seller and the agent, all right? So a listing contract is a contract that engages. It is actually an employment contract. It is not a real estate contract. So it's an employment contract that employs the agent to represent the seller of the product, property. That contract actually begins the second that they enter into the contract or that he, uh, the seller and the, buy and the agent agree to enter into this contract. And because we work under the statute of frauds, remember that it is a required written agreement that gives express agency to the agent. Now, we had discussed the type of agency that is conferred to a listing agent. That would be a special agent, meaning that they have literally been engaged to do one thing which is list the property for sale, all right? So the fact that the agent is deciding to work for the client is what is creates the agency, all right? It is the voluntary agreement between the people. It is not the money that creates the agency. You know, there are people that say all the time, oh, well, you know, I wasn't getting paid when I was the agent or I worked for free. That is irrelevant. <clears throat> Compensation does not create the agency. What creates the agency is the voluntary agreement or promise between the parties to actually decide to enter into that. All right. So that's what creates the agency. Now, in that agency, we have discussed before the responsibilities that get conferred. And if you remember our discussion, there were six of them. You have the care, exercise reasonable skill and care, make sure your client doesn't get harmed, obey, must follow their lawful orders, Loyalty, your loyalty lies to your client. Disclosure, you are required to disclose to your client. And then these last two here, accounting and confidentiality, play a role. Remember, you keep those two in perpetuity. All right, so during agency, you have all of uh, six of those, but then at the end of agency and at past agency, you have those. So post agency, all right. If there are any questions, all right, tell you what, let's do, let's keep going. So let's talk about the listing parties and all of the people that are mentioned inside of the listing agreement. Uh, in the listing agreement, it is an employment contract between the seller and the agent. Now, remember, that agent is the managing broker. He, they are the only recognized person that the state recognizes as an agent. Okay? Now, this is the key here. On the seller... You must actually in, be engaged with the person that has title to the property. So typically, it's the people that are named on the title's office, the, the title uh, policy. 
You can get that sometimes at the recorder's office. Now, you heard me say the word sometimes because recording has absolutely zero to do with ownership. So let's take a little side note here and go off and look at something. We have talked about this before, remember? There are people that I've said, okay, so if I have the title and I quit claim it to this person yesterday and I forgot today and I quit claimed it again to another person who went down and recorded it, at the recorder's office, my question to you is who is the owner? Number one or number two? And I will give you a couple quick seconds to think about that. All right? So go. Well, I hope that you picked the owner to be number one, all right? Number one is the owner. Just because this number two recorded it <clears throat> doesn't make him the owner. It makes him the owner of record or on record, but the reality is this guy, number one, is the owner. If you don't believe me, let's go through a couple examples to prove that. So let me ask you another question. What year did the recorder's office come about? Pick a number. Somebody make up a number. Let's make up this number. 1917. Great movie. Good guess. And if that were the case, are you telling me prior to 1917 we did not transfer property if there was no recorders around? No. Make it 1817. That should prove to you that recording has nothing to do with ownership. And if that doesn't get it, let's go one more. If I quit claim this guy, my property on this date, how did I manage to quit claim it again on this date? Because the second I quit claimed it here, he took possession and ownership. This wasn't even really mine to quit claim the next day. And I keep using finger quotes because actually this is more like fraud because I quit claimed it here on this date. I couldn't do it again on the next date. All right. So recording has actually nothing to do with ownership. All right. It is owner of record or it is a person on record, but that doesn't literally mean they are the owner of the property. You could have situations where uh, somebody bought the house yesterday and it physically hasn't gotten down to the recorder's office to actually get recorded yet. It, you know, it could be the fact that they bought it on land contract. So there are cases where the owner isn't the one that's typically on title. But that's usually the first place we go to look is to make sure that the client were dealing with is in fact the person on the title okay now the title could be at the recorder's office or the record of title you could also look and see whose name's on the taxes that also may help you hopefully what you get is this conversation between you and bill smith and bill smith's on the title and the title is the one that's recorded it's possible that you could be talking to sam jones and Bill Smith's on the record, so you're going to have to have this conversation with, hey, who's Bill Smith? And they're going to go, oh, well, that's the guy we bought it from last week. We are rehabbers, and we've rehabbed it, and we've gotten rid of it, and we want to flip it out. Okay, I needed to know that. You also want to make sure that you talk to all of the people that are on the record, and then there may be some names that may not be listed on the record, like husbands and wives or business partners, things like that. Do not forget, you've got this situation with married couples, tenants by the entirety. So if you have a married couple, you are going to have to have both parties 
sign the listing agreement. The spouse, if married, has to surrender their rights to the property. And they can do that by making sure that they engage um, an agent to do that. So they have to actually sign the listing to count so they can surrender their rights when they list the property, just like they must attend the closing so they could surrender their rights at the closing table. So don't forget that you've got tenants by the entirety and married couples that you may have to deal with. Now, often you're going to hear this, well, I'm on the note, but she's not on the title or something like that. That's not true. Tenants by the entirety definitely mean that a person that's married, that there is issues that you have to deal with. Now, one of the other things you may have to look at, obviously, is this whole t uh, corporation. This can get kind of funny, and I don't mean like strange funny. I literally mean like ha-ha funny, because when I bought property under the name of my corporation, the title company asked me if Raymond had permission to sign on behalf of the corporation. And I tried to tell her, I said, well, I am the corporation. They're like, no, 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 we need a legal document from your secretary stating that Raymond has the power to act as the president. So I actually had to write a document as the secretary of my corporation to give Raymond, me, the power to sign as the president of the corporation. And then I signed that document. So there was all kinds of uh, jacked up theory in my mind. But remember that you must have legal validation and the paperwork to ensure that the person who is actually on the paperwork, you know, hey, uh, I'm the executor of the state. Here's my sig. Well, we may need the proof that you are, in fact, the executor of the state. So we're going to need that will that names you as the executor. We're going to name that trust or need that trust that names you as the trustee. We're going to need that corporate resolution to show that you are in fact the owner of the property. These are all important factors when dealing with the party that is on the listing contract. So you've got to understand who is going to be the other side of the listing contract. Is it going to be one person? Is it going to be co-tenancy or concurrent ownership? Is it going to be some form of a trust or a corporation? Because we can represent all of those people to be the seller of real estate. So it's very important for that. <clears throat> now, when license law gets into play with agency disclosure, there are some other documents that we need to actually talk about and how that the license law really can play a big effect in this. So let's clear this out of the way and talk a little bit about license law and the agency disclosure. You must, in fact, disclose what agency is. Now, one of my favorite topics I talk about in school, if you had my class, was that we, you and I, could discuss all day what a positive power coefficient plays in the role of a nuclear reactor meltdown. The problem with that is, I don't believe that many of you know what a positive power coefficient is and where, how it plays a part in the heating of the core temperature, all right? So before we even have to have that discussion, we would actually have to have a discussion to explain that term. So I hope you're following this analogy because we have that same issue here. We can't talk about agency until we actually describe what agency is, describe it. So we actually have a form of the written office policy 
which is the description of the agency to your client. And in that written office policy, you talk about the listing agent and the listing agent's responsibilities. You talk about the selling agent and what the selling agent's responsibilities are. And you also discuss this last one called limited agent in that. And those are the three agencies that you actually d discuss or deal with when in the written office policy. So you must have the written office policy signed by the client prior to you actually signing the listing agreement because they really can't sign a listing agreement if they don't know or understand what agent and agency means. All right. So I think that's pretty self-explanatory that you must have this policy signed technically prior to the listing. And there are the three of them. Now remember, limited agency, some people refer to it as dual because these two are referred to as single agency, meaning you are representing just one side of the deal. In this particular limited case, you are actually representing both sides of the deal. So you hear the term called dual agency. Remember that there is a key concept in that definition. Listing agency or limited agency is where you are the listing and the selling agent on the same deal. All right. You can be a listing agent on one deal and a selling agent on another deal and it not be limited agent. Hell, you can be the listing agent for a guy on one deal and the selling agent for the same client on another deal. And that's not limited agent either. It's when you represent the listing and the selling agency on the same deal that limited agency comes into play. And that limited agency must in fact be disclosed prior to you actually doing any kind of agency work. All right, so I'm gonna take a break and we'll come right back and finish up here in just a second.